Hello, my friends, Evolutionary Energy Arts family. So, guys, did the church turn Jesus into God? And so we're talking about the Council of Nicaea and the fact that, you know, the early church believed many different things, many different things. They weren't in agreement. There was hundreds of different Gospels out there, let alone so many other lines of thinking. They didn't agree on anything until... Constantine's Council of Nicaea in 325 AD started to formulate exactly what everybody was going to have to believe. Constantine, of course, was the head of the Roman Empire, and it was having its issues, to say the least, and he was trying to keep it all pieced together, trying to unify people, and Christianity was sweeping through his kingdom and it was so fragmented, and there were so many different ways of believing and things that people were believing. You had your Gnostics, you had all different types of, of people that were getting enraptured with this new, well, or was it really new, faith. Uh, and so he had a vision, or he said he had a vision, and that vision was conquered by the sign of the cross. And he said he saw this up in the heavens in uh, St. Paul, the Apostle Paul, had a vision as well, if you remember, on the road to Damascus. A lot of visions in the sky, and we see that throughout our entire history. So when we're looking at Constantine and what type of a guy he was, well, you know, he was all about maintaining power, completely maintaining power. That's all about what he was. During his reign, he granted new opportunities to Christians and helped advance the power of the early Catholic Church. We saw, if you look back into the 1800s, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, when the immigrants were coming over to the U.S., as soon as they walked off the boat, they were uh, enlisted in a political party in many cases. Uh, during the Civil War, they were actually sent off, you know, immediately to, uh, conscripted and signed off to fight in the Civil War, and many of them were just automatically enlisted and into the political parties and given the opportunity to vote, and they were used. And so we see here as well that there's always been those in political power that will main do anything to maintain their political power, and they will use any manner available to them, in including basically using our faith. He is a man who had his wife and son killed as well. Um, so he could be very, very ruthless. Uh, and, you know, most definitely he was somebody uh, that could do things that needed to be done in order to maintain his grip on his power, as we see. So we have Pope Leo, Pope Leo X. He, his, he's... <laughs> actually come out and said something that has you know been debated by many but it is a statement that he is credited with pope leo x his earliest known source of this statement is actually a polemical work by a protestant john bale the anti-catholic acta romanorum Pontif pontificum which was first translated from latin into english and basically he just says uh, we all know very well how profitable this fable or this myth of Christ has been to us in our company, and meaning the Catholic Church, and also the continuance, really, of the Holy Roman Empire, which just simply morphed and changed form. So we have Orphism, and Orphism is interesting. When we start looking into it, we start looking into different myths, we see that there's a lot of things that are very, very congruent, and they go together. And so it's very easy to just start to view everything as really what we're talking about is a cosmic theology. We're talking about things that go on in the heavens. And many people believe this is the case, the case that so much of our, our myths and our beliefs are just, you know, people trying to make sense of great events and things they see in the, in the sky. And we'll touch on that as well. So there were many, many different deities that were worshipped that were thought to have died and re been resurrected. And uh, here we see, looking at Orphic beliefs, surviving written fragments show a number of beliefs about the afterlife similar to those in the Orphic myth mythology. 
So Dionysus is one. And, you know, here we're going way before the time of Christ. So we have tablets going back to the 5th century, and it actually goes back even farther than that, talking about the myth of Dionysus. Do these match up exactly? No. But if, if in case, as Pope Leo was talking about, uh, the myth of Christ, it, perhaps it was a myth that was taken from many different sources and rolled up into one ball and given to uh, the followers in order to be an easy transition from all the different quote-unquote pagan beliefs that were being you know, followed all throughout the empire of the Roman Empire, which was expansive as we know. It's so fascinating to see these that are really, they're almost universal in origin. And, you know, Christ, Krishna, anointed ones, Christ and Krishna, the similarity between those has really intrigued many throughout time. And Krishna predates Christ by thousands of years, thousands of years. And Krishna is an incarnation of God, the God Vishnu, which is the preserver part of a holy trinity. The Hindu holy trinity predates Christian holy trinity by thousands and thousands of years. It's not even close. Many believe that really Christ uh, in some ways was just a yogi, just another enlightened individual like a Buddha. Uh, and many believe he is an ascended master. Again, some believe he is Sananda, and Sananda is again out of the Vedic tradition and goes back again farther than Christ, but they believe he is the same being. Again, a divine being sent here in order to guide us. And what happens is that the powers that be take it, twist it, and use it to separate us by creating specific dogmas which can control people, especially those of a very fundamentalist mindset where they want to be told what they are to believe. And now they don't want to do the research. They just want to be told and they just accept. So we see here Tammuz. Tammuz is another one, you know, born on December 25th. Why December 25th? There's a bunch of them that are recognized around that time. And of course, it's thought that if Christ, you know, ever did really walk the earth, if Jesus, you know, Yesu, uh, Yeshua, everybody has their own preferences and people get very uh, vehement about it, really. Um, if he ever did walk the earth, and if you're looking for evidence outside of the given scriptures, there's not really much there. Uh, there probably was somebody you know, named Jesus. Jesus is really Joshua. You know, Joshua, the same same basic name when you go farther back. So there were probably many, uh, exactly. But there's something bigger that's going on here. And so here you see the entire earth is lying about the power of ancient Babylon and the spell cast by Nimrod and his mother. Now, I'm, I'm not saying I agree with that, but I'm just saying that there's a lot of similarities when we start looking at these beings. As we were talking about Dionysus, which... Uh, basically became or transitioned into the Bacchus uh, group cult, people call it. There's too many things. They're so similar. Here's Tammuz feeding from the breast of his mother. And of course, we see the Virgin Mary and Jesus. And we've looked at other statues of this. And, and this is Tammuz again with a staff with a pine cone on it. And we've seen that pine cone. Pine cone represents the pineal gland. Interesting, is it not? Because we've seen that all over the Vatican, and we've seen the Pope with pine cones on his staff. And we also see here are the two serpents when are intertwined around the staff with the pine cone, and this is representing Kundalini. The pine cone is where the Kundalini flows up to. It flows up from its dormancy in the base of the spine and the sacrum, and, and goes up through the Ida and the Pingala, the two intertwined serpents, the, the masculine and the feminine energies rises up the shashimna through the center and initiates the kundalini process so this is all what this is pointing to in reality tammuz was hailed as the son of the sun and the first letter of his name became in time the symbol of the sun worship human sacrifices to the sun god were offered on this initial letter made of wood known as a cross his birthday december 25th was honored more and more and the first day of the week was called Sun's Day, or Sunday. 
So interesting, you know, the take there. Of course, we've seen the fish heads, <laughs> the papal mitre uh, hats that they wear, which are referring back to the uh, to Dagon, and also back to uh, Eons or Yoans, uh, which were the fish god people that came from the sea that we might equate with Ea Enki of the um, Anunnaki as well. So there's there's a lot of clues. Do we have the exact, you know, blow by blow on exactly what happened? No, we're all still guessing and conjecturing, but we could see how many things go together. And Mithras, Mithra, born of a virgin, born on December 25th, 12 disciples. You know, you've seen a lot of this stuff before, probably 1200 BC. Maybe you haven't. But it's it's very very interesting that these these myths are are really universal myths, and so you know some believe that Jesus is a copy of Mithras, and some believe it's a copy of Dionysus, or you know perhaps Tammuz, or perhaps Krishna, or perhaps all of the above, and um, you know it's up to each to go ahead and explore and make your own decisions on this. And, of course, there are those that are just simply born into a system or become convinced of something, and, and that's good enough for them, and they'll try to convince everybody else in the world that they are right, because if they can do that, then it verifies their own existence and their own philosophy. It makes them feel safe. And we have Addis from 1200 BC, you know, dead for three days, resurrected. Very interesting. And then, of course, we have Osiris, which is perhaps the most ancient one of the bunch. He was known as the Lord of Love, King of the Living, the Eternal Lord. After Isis, Osiris was the most popular and enduring of all the Egyptian gods. His worship spanned thousands of years from shortly before the early dynastic period, which is about 3150 BCE. So, you know, over 3,000 years before Christ. And it's interesting that when you go into um, the rituals of the Golden Dawn, and you see that, again, they use the Judaic Christian tradition in their rituals, but they also combine it with the Egyptian. So they equate in these rituals Osiris with Christ right there. Uh, and it is possible that Osiris was worshipped in some form in the pre-dynastic period, even back as far <clears throat> as 6000 B.C., so then we're talking 6,000 years before Christ, 8,000 years ago. Very, very obvious. This is a much, much older story. As you know, most of you guys know that have done research, uh, pretty much everything in the Bible is taken from older myths, older legends, and it's just done in a Cliff Notes form. And it's, it's spliced together. So we see here, Merry Christmas from the gods that were born around December 25th. And we see a bunch of them, tons of them going on there. And is it all really relating to this, the Southern Cross? You know, December 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. And the 24th, you know, is it all about really the dying and the resurrection of the sun, you know, at, at the winter solstice? Very well could be. It very, very well could be. That would make a lot of sense when we look at astrotheology and, you know, the symbolism that's really there underlying all these things. And again, we see, you know, this is over here, modern imagery of Mary holding Jesus. We see the aura. Some might see it as a solar disk, right? And uh, this is a Coptic one as well. And then, of course, we have Isis and Horus, which, again, are thousands and thousands of years, 3,000, maybe 6,000 years before Christ. And we see it again. And it's just too many similarities, too many to just blow it off. You know, and then yet we have people that say these are all counterfeits, even though they're thousands and thousands of years before Christianity ever existed. These are all counterfeits. Every single one of them is just Satan trying to take away from the authenticity of Christ. But, you know, honestly, that is just scrambling and trying to make your mode of reality fit 
in this crazy world that we see. Dying and resurrected gods, archetypal manifestations of psychological need. Is that what it's all about? The fact that we can't face our own mortality as well. Um, and so we put these stories, we contrive these things, these myths, these legends to reassure us you know, of our own immortality, perhaps, and the fact that we will not just perish into nothingness. And this goes into Dionysus. And I, I'll have all the links for you guys. I'll encourage you to go ahead, read into them. Their stories are not verbatim, but we can see this. Now, Zagreus is an Orphic, Orphic myth, and uh, he was the child of Zeus and Persephone. And so he was also resurrected and uh, equated with Dionysus. And this gets more into Dionysus, demystified. So these universal myths, in many people's opinion, are really just talking about our consciousness. And really what's what we're talking about here is that Christ consciousness, or the consciousness of a unity, really, is what we're looking at. Unity consciousness, a heart-based center is what they're they're trying to point us to. Although in in their own way, each story is told differently, but yet we can see there's a congruency here, and these things all go together. And you know, unfortunately, the dark side has used dogma and theology in order to control us, and they still do control the minds and the purse strings of billions of people on this planet as more than half of the people on the planet are following the Abrahamic traditions, the Judeo-Christian Islamic traditions, the, the majority of the people on the planet follow that belief system. Of course, it's split up into thousands of different subsets, and nobody agrees with each other uh, when it comes to that. But this is a time where we are to recognize everything that's going on and recognize that the true key is living from the heart center and actually embodying what Christ was showing and what Christ consciousness shows. And whether we call it Christ consciousness or Krishna consciousness, you know, it depends on our background. It depends on how open-minded we are. In reality, do we need any dogma? Some do, unfortunately, and some don't. But it, we're all in our own place and our own position spiritually. But we can, if we look hard enough, see that, you know, this truly is a cosmic tale. And this is a tale about who exactly we are and how we are to embody the positive forces of light and love if we're ever going to change this planet into something that it has the potential to be. Unfortunately, you know, what our history is one of control and dogma and separation. But as we move forward and we're able to discover that, you know, these things have deeper origins. And what really, really matters is coming together as a society and getting past all these dogmatic beliefs that separate us. It's been 2,000 years since it is thought that Christ had walked the earth. And still, would not most agree that the world is very far away from being a harmonious unity of consciousness. So obviously, the belief systems we have had have not brought about that heaven on earth. There must be something more. Now, if we each did embrace the teachings of love and unity and allowing ourselves each to be a distinct individual without trying to force our way on the other. And if we showed the mercy and the compassion that we see in the stories of Christ and, and the teachings of Christ, that of you know giving somebody your cloak as well as your tunic if they ask for something, that of selling your belongings and giving it to the poor and following the way of peace and love, and that of not being greedy and not being lustful and envious and jealous, but simply allowing others to live their lives as we live our, our own life in peace and harmony, then we can manifest that heaven on earth. For it is said, the kingdom of God lies within you. It's, it's within you right now. Again, it was said also 
don't look here, don't look there. And uh, because the kingdom of God comes from within, it's, it's not going to be um, something that's going to be imposed on us. Not the true kingdom, because this false kingdom that we've been living under is a system that's been imposed on us in order to control and consolidate the wealth and power of this world into the hands of the few and they've done an amazing job of doing that but it's time for a spiritual revolution it's time for us to shed our dogmatic beliefs and see the underlying unity of all things and will everyone do that in this lifetime chances are no but we will see what happens and with the earth changes that are going on and the cleansing that we see going on Perhaps more will wake up, and perhaps we can start to see some true change upon the earth. As always, my friends, like, share, subscribe. Thank you for your support on Patreon and Ko-Fi. I look forward to your comments. God bless and namaste.